Okay, so we used to buy a char um, Pat Barber um, with Acer Environmental. Um, Acer is, we've been working on aquatic restoration, mitigation, stormwater, and wastewater pretty much my whole career. Uh, we specialize in restoration of benthic macroinvertebrates. I have a patent pending on growing uh, aquatic insects in a bag that I put in the water and can grow and translocate those bags to other other locations. The reason why I'm really interested in biochar, I got involved with it six years ago. Um, and dealing with this, a friend of mine was showing me about remediation, started doing the research into it and found out what it could do with remediation of the water. And got very excited about that because um, helping aquatic insects, you know, makes my projects look a lot better. So I was trying to figure out ways to, I was working on several projects that had water quality problems, trying to find a way to stop those. So we were looking to remediate the contaminants and nutrients in various types of habitat. We could talk field test, I've been conducting field tests on pond streams and coal mines, municipal waters, farm pond streams and detention ponds. I've, I've done this all over the Eastern US so far. Um, my background, we've, I've been testing different types of biochar. I have, a lot of y'all have you know, probably have seen, I've gotten hold of your material, I've done some testing uh, and that sometimes the results don't always come out the way people expect. Um, testing I use, the uh, lab I use is the University of Georgia Water and Soils Laboratory. They utilize either an infiltration column test or they use a sh system where they shake or spin an, uh, the biochar with an analyte for 16 hours. The testing found when the materials I've been doing on testing that materials I've brought in is a lot of the biochar I've been getting has been inconsistent in the way it looks. A lot of it sometimes comes in partially cooked. The sizes are di they're becoming different sizes. They come with different moisture contents. Uh, the moisture content is, I've had a couple of show up that I could almost pull the water, pour, the, pour the water out of them. Um, a lot of the biochars I've been testing, they shed nitrogen and phosphorus. The absorption for nitrogen and phosphorus, a lot of others have told me in heavy metals is not as high as many people have advertised. The best over biochar that I've been used so far is produced by biochar now. They have the most consistent size. Their moisture content is always consistent, it's very dry. And the testing is shown, I, I have done, I saw their test, they provided me with their testing and I've done my own independent testing. I went also, I looked at carrying capacities of their biochar and is they're generally in the 80 to 90% plus on most of your heavy metals and nutrients. So first project I was working in a coal mine uh, for the removal of aluminum. We had two small ponds that were coming into a larger pond than into a stream. Our aluminum levels were at 9.6 milligrams per liter. West Virginia DEQ told them that they had to have their uh, aluminum limits at four milligrams per limit uh, liter. Uh, initially, I put the biochar into these ponds and we got no absorption at all. Then we discovered the pH was below three. So immediately the client went in and he started adding caustic soda to the system. If y'all know much about uh, working in coal mines, they play with the pH to get certain um, chemicals to drop out. So they added, bring up the pH. Immediately when we got above four, the uh, aluminum started to reduce, the amount started to reduce. When we got closer to neutral, we, were, we found out our aluminum levels get, went to 0 0.3 milligrams per liter. Uh, we used a sock and bag that last, lasted in these ponds for over eight months. The problem we had was them doing the treatment with the caustic soda, uh, a flock, flocculant came into the water and it started clogging up the bags. Uh, in these bags, we actually put in um, bags, across, the bags that we put in, were wrapped within a courier bag, which helped it a lot. Uh, we were thought we were going to put the, be putting these bags into a living stream, so we put them in courier to protect, protect the silt sock from uh, being ripped up by the stream. It ended up we were putting them in outlets, and we put in about we were using a rice grain size biochar, and uh, we ended up putting in shredded wood. Now there are some larger biochar chunks I've done lately utilized instead of using the shredded wood, but that was to try to allow water because this rice grain biochar tends to clump and get really hard. Um, 
it'll get hard and won't let the water through. It's very difficult. And when you're in a place where water's flowing, you've got to be able to do that. This is what it looks like. On the left was one of the ponds. There was an outlet coming from that pond. And on the right is the other pond. We put the pond, we put these in the pond so that during high flows, it would go up and over the top of them. And then if you'll see the one on the right, we're circling the outlet structure. Rocks were the outlet on the left, and then we had an outlet structure on the right. And then we put a treated uh, another bag in in the right at the outlet. So then for selenium, water was leaving is coming from three different tre treatment bonds. These were in all three different locations, and their their levels of selenium were over 10 milligrams per liter. The West Virginia limit for aluminum, I think it's supposed to be for selenium. Sorry, I got it error there is 4.7 milligrams per liter. We utilized a series of socks and bags wrapped around the outlets of each one of these ponds. Uh, the bags were 20 feet uh, long and they were stacked on top of each other. Uh, we went in front of one outlet, we did two stacks and one of them we did three stacks. An additional 20 bags were put into the ponds on two of the sites. And these were eight inch by 48 inches and they're floated throughout the ponds. The selenium levels in all these situations were redu reduced to below two milligrams per liter. And uh, actually one of the sites we, we were able below two milligrams uh, per liter, they didn't measure it past that. Um, the bags, then the bags in the pond, the bags that we floated in the pond uh, by accident, we were trying to catch selenium before it got to our bags, helping reduce the limit. And there was an algal bloom going on and it would disappear after three weeks of putting the bags. The last I'd heard about these bags, I, the client, I've lost contact with them about what they were doing, but after a year and a half, the selenium bags were still removing uh, the selenium from the water. This is what it looked like. We're going low tech here, folks. Um, you'll see these bags, there are three bags actually in there. We went all the way to the bottom. I put the block on there to make sure they stayed on the bottom. We, we were forcing it. We, we put these where the storm event would come up and go over the top of them. Then we put a second treatment layer before it got off site. And we have bags floating in the pond that's off to the left. We did this in one series. In another pond, we basically went to a pothole below the lake, uh, the treatment pond. And we put these, put these bags out here for treatment as well. And they work very well. And uh, case study for nitrogen and phosphorus, the socks and we floated bags in West Virginia, stopped the algal bloom that occurred in three, way, three weeks. A five acre pond in South Georgia had over 500 acres of farmland upstream. Um, we utilized it, we put prior to treatment of this pond, the algal blooms in this system went from May to the end of October every year. This is my actually my neighbor's house, your, uh, pond. And uh, in 2017, we had saw 10 socks uh, into this bat, into this, and these by they were all eight inch by 48 inch. Results we found 2017, algal blooms disappeared after a month. There were no more. 2018, there were no algal blooms the next year. 2019, well, we uh, had an unexpected situation. The lake turned clear. Um, he could stand at any point on his lake, look in and see fish. Um, he could see the fish or the bottom from one end of the lake to the other. So we moved half the bags and the lake turned green and no algal blooms the rest of the year. This year, uh, he had no algal blooms till just recent, right at the end of the season. And But the color of the lake had turned back green and stayed green. He was just starting to get um, an algal bloom. Now, this over this winter, we're gonna probably either put out more socks or just add to the socks. I'm trying to determine at this time, working with him what he wants to do. This is what we look like. This is what the sock looks like. Uh, the little ball you see on the left is actually a plastic cannonball. They work really well, they're removable. I've also used the little balls that the kids, your kids play with, you know, little kids play with that you can buy for a dollar at the store. You wrap it in the courier fabric, it stretches around it. This is an eight inch by 48 inch. Uh, system. Uh, we attach it to the we, the bottom of it. We have a piece of paracord. We tie it to a block and float it. it, it we usually try to put it in the upper end of the stream uh, of the pond, I mean, so we get water to push past it. And it can be located over bubblers or other dispersion devices. That's some of the talks I've been having with folks about other places to utilize it. 
this is what they look like in the water. The one on the left, you see sort of sitting on top, it ended up within an hour of being there, it ended up floating. Uh, on the right, that's what it looks like just below the surface. We can manage, we can manage the depth at which they were put in. This is that, this is that mining land uh, where they had the algal bloom. That algal bloom was gone in three weeks. This is the South Georgia pond. On the left is before, and we got the after. That was two months later. Uh, it was the first one was in June. Uh, this was May June of uh, 2017, and on the right is uh, end of the season. It was about August September that time period. Prince William County. We looked at outfalls of two treatment ponds, one at a wood recycling facility and one at a landfill site. The wood recycling facility. Initial sampling showed that we reduced the BOD in phosphorus and nitrogen, but the BOD in the water was so high that it basically clogged up the bags. It coated all the biochar and it, it just stopped them from absorbing anything. And the landfill site, now on the landfill site, we had a problem with geese that were living in the pond. So, you know, what's going on there. Uh, they were really putting a lot of load in there. Our phosphorus, when we after, all we did was we wrapped, we put the bags in just below the outfall and we double stacked them. We dug a trench, put them in. We couldn't cut the water off. We couldn't cut all the water off. We still got phosphorus levels that went from point. So we went down below, just below that and sampled as it came downstream. And we went from 0.8 milligrams of phosphorus to 2.2. The BOD went from 35 milligram, up being over 35 milligrams per liter to four milligrams per liter. That's a pristine stream. Escherichia coli, this, this one really shocked me when it happened. Uh, they had 2,419 uh, CFUs per 100 milliliter and reduced it to 344 CFUs per 100 milliliter. Remember, we couldn't cut off all the water. And the total Kendall nitrogen went from four milligrams to two milligrams. So this is what it looked like at the outfall below the wood facility. Um, we basically dug a trench, put the bags in, we're putting the rocks on it, we were trying to force the bags down to cut off the water and force all the water through it. It's still the water would back up and then find a way around it. It's cause of this high BOD that was coming out of this pond. It coated the bags very quickly and made it very, very difficult to treat. So some of the studies of interest that I've been following this DuPont study in Front Royal and the South River utilizing biochar to prevent mercury from entering the river. Evidently, the results have been very good. Virginia Tech has a big study that they did. Uh, it's very available in bioreactors, denitrifying bioreactors. Uh, that system was in for quite a while, worked very well. Uh, I talked to the people who, done, who worked on that project, interviewed all the people who participated in that, and they had found they had tested a whole bunch of different types of biochar, so did DuPont, and they both ended up utilizing the biochar now, biochar, for this for this process for their projects. They said it worked the best on doing the absorption. Um, there is a rice biochar we've been looking at and working with um, that is now about to receive an NSF certification for use in drinking water. Uh, that's very exciting. It's, that's that's out there. I've been working with Appalachian State as well, using core materials around the, the silt sock and filled with biochar with mycelium to uh, remediate nutrient loads in streams. The results they were getting out of that were initially really, really good. One of the biggest problems we had were that the, the streams were messing with, they were working with, uh, had problems with, um, they had high, they, they had problems with sediments that were moving down there. The cattle, they were full of cattle, and, but the results they were seeing a very significant drop in nitrogen and phosphorus in those systems. So, and then I've also been working with Phil Bloom at TerraChar, and he's been running experiments with his, his uh, biochar, and he's been, conduct, he's been conducting it, and he actually has stopped algal blooms in several ponds. It took about a month for, for him to start seeing results of this. What's needed for the future? This is, a, this is where I'm headed. I'm trying to, and I need help. You know, anybody can help me with this. I think more studies need to be done in real world conditions. I've seen a lot of, a lot of results talking with universities where they're doing 
in labs and it's great we need that information then they move outdoors and say they're outside but they're in a lab they're in a controlled situation we need real world conditions we need to understand it and we also need to be working with the commercially available biochar i mean the universities you know you're making smaller batches and you're testing that it, you know it's great they make a great biochar but there's a problem on the end that it can't be replicated we need to be able to utilize what's commercially available out there and have it tested and make sure we know it does. We need a larger sample size of lakes and treatment ponds that need to be conducted. I'm trying, but you know, most of the, you'll see those projects that I just showed you, I've done those on my own dime. Uh, we need to understand the interaction of microbes and my ceiling with biochar in the field. You can't tell me that the bags that I put out for aluminum, uh, selenium, nitrogen, and phosphorus, all those bags were surviving uh, because the biochar kept absorbing those, those contaminants. There's something going on with the microbes. And I know that on the mining people, they're utilizing 57 stone stuffed with microbes as bioreactors. I think biochar would be a great alternative to that. I, I wanted to really test that. I ha almost had a couple of projects, but they, you know, the other guys are proven we weren't. So we had, you know, I'd love to have tried it. Uh, more work needs to be done with biochar and bioreactors, just like I said. And then biochar needs to be tested with sediment streams to determine how they can sort in the bed and be sequestered legacy sediments. I've been playing around with the biochar, dumping it in a stream, seeing how it sorts itself out. It's amazing. You can barely see it once it gets into the streams. It'll be there for a day or two and the water will start pushing it downstream and then it works in with the sediments. And I'll go back later and dig up sediments and locations and I'll find it a foot a foot or more deep as it sorts its way into the bottom. Once it gets wet, it floats for a while, but once it gets wet, it goes to the bottom. I've done the same thing in lakes. I just didn't have, I don't have the equipment or the money to do the testing on what happens in the bottoms. So we need more types of testing such as column tests, which have real world applications or the spinning with the analyte, just to test the biochar to see what's going on in these laboratories so we can back up what we're saying. And then individual producers of biochar need to conduct more testing of their product and post those results, real results. So um, that's it. I hope I have brought a lot of, uh, got y'all's interest in ways to apply this.